All righty. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of One Plus One, your place for inconvenient truth telling and myth busting. And in our uh, Make Me Want to Holler series, which is all things the uh, which is all things the Black Diaspora, Black America, Black Britain, Black Canada, and you know, and the re and the rest of the diaspora. I'm very honored with the guests that we have on. We have Geechee Ya, who is a co uh, yes yes he, he's a co host and co panelist of Earn Your Liberation, which is part of uh, Black Power Media. And yeah, we're here to talk about uh, all the things that's affecting uh, Black America. So, fir so first of all, Geechee, thank you for coming on the program, especially on a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> thanks thanks for having me, man. And good to uh, not be seeing y'all, but good to be heard by whoever's listening. So peace to y'all as well. Thank you very much. And and yes, it's a real honor to have you. And now, Geechee, I uh I didn't actually type this up as a question, but is there anything about your background you want to uh talk about with our audience? Uh because because that was a very brief introduction. So if there's anything mm -hmm. else you want to explain about yourself and your background, please go, you know, go right there. Yeah, out. so uh Geechee, y'all, I'm, I'm originally from Charleston, South Carolina. So if anybody ever heard of Gullah people particularly people who've been captured from um, West Africa, Angola, and Sierra Leone, been forced to bring to, uh, forced to come to the U.S. and other Caribbean places to grow rice, indigo, and other things that the Europeans could not grow themselves. Um, I'm an organizer, currently now in Atlanta, part of Community Movement Builders, uh, national organization, also Black Power Media, and, you know, yeah, I'm just an organizer, researcher, uh, journalist, and I'm in, in I'm into ecological liberation for for the planet and also uh liberation and and for all oppressed people fantastic and uh oh wow we're, we're definitely gonna have to explore that so, you, you, you know uh definitely gonna have to explore that with you in the future <laughs> yeah. all right Geechee, let's let so let's get underway now before we talk about uh the various politics uh, that are affecting uh black media which unfortunately black corporate media doesn't cover i did want to ask you very quickly this question which is uh which is which is i want your take on this uh what do you think it's going to take for the broad left in the u.s you know people power movements from the black left latinx left the workers rights movement the feminists the queer liberationists the environmental movement eco-socialist movement and even the anti-war anti-imperialist movement what do you think it's going to take for all of them to show more urgent solidarity to the plight of, you know, Native Americans, Indigenous Hawaiians, and and Native Alaskans? I'm 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 curious your response on that. Yeah, so so definitely, I think it's important to be, um, have clarity around the massive ability for the U.S. to uh, perform some type of genocide on people all across the globe, but also create prop propaganda to convince you that they are actually doing them a service. They are they are the police of the world, whatever they call themselves, uh, whatever day they want to. But I think it's important to like understand the ability and the effectiveness of that propaganda. And what happens is victims of the atrocities and the propaganda, they consciously or unconsciously become vectors. I don't know if you ever heard Diallo spill about victim versus vector. A victim is somebody who's being impacted, assaulted, and a vector is somebody who spread that. So if you got negative U.S. propaganda as a victim and then you start to spread it, you become a vector. And so I feel like people are consciously and unconsciously engaged in being a vector for the U.S. Um, and so I think that's one of the deterrents of even being able to form, form solidarity with other oppressed peoples. And if you can remember the U.S. Supreme Court, they literally, with a straight face, once said that the settlers stole North America fair and square. <laughs> so to use that in the same sentence, like they stole it fair and square, you you're dealing with that level of pathology. And, and those people, again, they have a massive reach on the, their ability to educate people, right? Whether it's the school systems or educate people through entertainment. So they have a really, really highly... Um, intelligence in creating art and getting us emotionally connected to artists, actors, musicians, who literally feed us the same lies about U.S. propaganda. So when you think about like historical principles of unity that African people had with those other groups that you just named, um, so African people try to fight exploitation, 
and fight enslavement, they normally fled to uh, camps where indigenous people took them in and create up some type of um, uh, maroon type, maroonage. And so that's always been a thing. So when you really look at it, African people who fight for freedom, they normally uh, ally with other people who are fighting for freedom. Um, and I think when we get to a point where we are serious about our liberations, we will again seek people in this multipolar world to work with, which will be the indigenous um, in the US, the indigenous in Alaska and Hawaii. And I also I think like those people, majority of those people have this understanding again, that they need to live in a world where the ecology and economy centers the majority of um, people and it also has a direct confrontation to destroy the genocidal oppression U.S. government. And so if you have allies or other people who are doing, who want to do the same thing, I think it's important for you to, uh, you know, work with them. Um, I think more African people obviously have to join organizations to build that analysis to see why it's important. Um, and then also, as you think about like Hawaii and, and, living in a, a again a multipolar world the importance of teaming up with other occupied people is so important and when you think also about hawaii and the occupation of hawaii a lot of the african people who went to hawaii is going to help the u.s maintain this occupation so that's mm. something that we would have to grapple with um sometime in the future and then the same thing with the uh the natives in alaska when you look at the natives in alaska and the late natives in the u.s both of them life expectancy is being shortened shortened every year so um we all are under this thing you know including african people that's in the us all of us our life is life is life expectancy is becoming lower and lower and lower as we um you know try to survive or or thrive or whatever we're trying to do under this uh genocidal government and i'll in here um i remember once considering doing a contract with the Black Food Justice Org who claims that they are into food sovereignty. And I'm just like, okay, that's fine. And then I asked them, how do your thrusts of becoming food sovereign, how do that relate to your engagement with the natives? One question. And the two question is, Nicaragua across the street, right, who actually engaged in food sovereign, 90% of the food is grown there, but the U.S. is constantly trying to destabilize them from being a food sovereign country. So my ask again is how do you as a black American or a black African in America fighting for food sovereignty, what is your goal to have a relationship with the natives and what's your goal to do that in a country that actually is try trying to stop food sovereignty for other countries? So when I asked that question, I think that that's the reason why I didn't get the contract, but it's just, you know, it's something if you're serious about our conditions and changing our conditions, you would have to ally with the people who also don't want those conditions to be placed on them on their lives. Perfect. As 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 KRS one one as KRS once said, you can never have justice on stolen land. So, <laughs> so that's a so that's a perfect segue then to uh, to this question because you've definitely opened up a whole can of uh, worms now, and I wanted <laughs> to ask you this question, which is. Where do you stand on the issue of state terror when it comes to the police? Like, are you in favor of abolishing the police or 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 simply radical reforms of the police, such as ending the demilitarization of the police, ending the drug war, ending broken windows policing, and and basically, you know, and 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 basically what Glenn Ford, the late Glenn Ford was an advocate of, which was community control of the police. And whichever is your response to that question. Why one or yeah, why one over the other? You know, so so we don't fall into a, all states and all police are bad, all you know, uh, uh, government protectors are bad. I think it's important to just begin to ask, like, first, what is the acceptable social order that you want to live in? Um, and before we can address that question, how should we deal with disorder? So for instance, disorder in Nicaragua and Cuba, right, needs to be grappled with and, and, and resolved. The disorder in the US, why do we call it disorder? And what is the, again, what is the order in which that you're comfortable with living in? 
And so the U.S. is not a legitimate government, is not a legitimate establishment, as they told you. They stole the land fair and square, right? So for their police, there's no way that their police could be a legitimate force. And the only thing, the only disorder will be is a organized masses, a people who want to be um, freedom fighters, a people who want to have global peace. Those will be the disorder, people who want to interrupt the social order of capitalism. And so there's no reforming, <laughs> there's no reforming that. Like you can't reform the armed agents who want to have the social order in a certain type of way. So as you speak in the context of, of the US, I don't think you can reform an organized terror squad who was at its uh, birth against enslaved Africans and eventually the descendants of those en enslaved Africans who are exploited labor. So they, they're literally against labor and the forced labor. They literally, against, they've never been on the side of those people. You know, even if you look at the uh, the black, and let's not talk about black cops, but when you look at the top black cop, um, I forgot her name now, the black Supreme Court judge. If you look at her record, She's against oh, uh, the, uh, Katanji Jackson. Katanji yeah. Jackson. She's against the land. Uh, I mean, she's against the um the renters. She's against the employees. And every time that there was cop abuse of citizens, she sided with the cops. So she sided with the cops, the landlords, and the owners. Law enforcers, whether they are in a costume with a badge and a gun, or they're in another costume with a gown. <laughs> they they're not here to be reform or help you or anybody who who uh who look like me or you um brown or lighter or whatever you want to do it. So I'm more in, I'm more interested in talking about studies and organizing that leads to abolishing the U.S. genocidal government. In turn, that will come with different techniques and methods of defending a revolution or whatever government that is. So a Nicaragua police, I'm willing to like more than a US of police because they're protecting and keeping order of a certain thing and we should more talk about the certain thing that we want um so i think it's important for that and then so the idea of of, of america particularly cuz when we say america even in while while i lived in central america they sometimes say america too it's the americas there's a central there's a north there's a south right but particularly the united states um this idea of confronting and destroying um, in a way to not necessarily reform um, this this thing that has been, this project, right? The American project that has been shit since its inception. It's, it's never been legitimized. It's never been something good. It's been shit since the beginning. So the conversations, again, around reform is just not making sense. And, and I'll, I'll leave you with a couple of these points. The U.S. police never have been our friend. They don't have any chance to be our friend. They have never shown any inkling of being humane. Um, they have never shown a care for African people. They've never uh, shown a care for indigenous people. They are very much an anti-people institution. Um, they only exist to serve international capital. Um, the police are in place to jail African agency or black agency, equality, self-determination, political expression. We got Mumia still in jail today. You got Peltier still in jail today, right? And so, again, there has to be like a very clear line that when you look at the Constitution, you look at these things, as we're going to talk about, slavery is reform, not abolish. And so if you know that it's reform and not abolish, a shout out to Dr. CBS, who talks about the structural location of blackness. There's no way to readjust this this thing, and and I, mean, I won't say there's no way, but there's not a focus to readjust that type of thing, right? There's more so of uh, understanding methodologies and ways of subverting and abol abolishing this particular government that's inhumane, that centers. Profit and parasitism as opposed to people and the planet. So these literally people are committing ecocide and genocide and their armed agents of the state is 
trying to keep things flowing to, to the end of destruction. So again, there's no way to reform people who are um are literally trying to reassemble and make different iterations of of, of slavery. Uh, one moment, let me. Uh, mm -hmm. in, then that's a perfect segue then to. Uh, Actually, that's a very perfect segue to this question, which is in the spaces you organize with uh, in the black community, the black left community, and even and even sometimes when you uh, when you interact with the wider left uh, community, voicing, uh, uh, yeah. So 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 when you meet often with like you know the uh, with the black left community and even the wire left community, uh, are are people voicing uh, enough that we need to end the drug wars? That we need various constitutional reforms, like closing the loophole to the Thirteenth Amendment that allows slavery once somebody is convicting of a crime, or ending corporate personhood and repealing that disastrous Supreme Court decision, and that we need more social racial justice causes in the Constitution. And if the answer is no, why do you, uh, you know, why do you think that is? Right. So I want to make sure that I'm not here to speak for the left and, and all the variations that exist within the left. Um, I can only like speak for myself and then invite you to dialogue more about what I'm saying. Um, and, I, and I would assume you and your guests and everybody is aware of the Monroe Doctrine. You'll be aware of U.S. imperialism. So the U.S., rather we hear... I'm in Atlanta right now, uh, IAT, Haiti, Central America, South America. Anything that is formed, that is formed as a non-reformist reform that allows us to better organize ourselves to destroy America's project the way it is, I'm going to be okay. I'm okay with that, right? So I wouldn't say that the overall objective is to change the Constitution and make the Constitution, like... Again, the document in itself is shit. The people who created the document is shit. But living in reality, if there needs to be some type of, again, non-reformist reform, maybe it's better clean water, universal basic income, whatever it is going to get us to be able to organize more to destroy this American project, that's what I'm for. Um, but neither I or you should have the illusion that the most dangerous, the worst enemies that we've ever faced, we can't be on an illusion that they will not adjust and amend. Again, just as, as it in the 13th Amendment, as they amend slavery and amend whatever, like they will they will do whatever it takes to readjust stuff. And so we should have the goal to readjust our strategies and plans. Um, because again, as your enemy maintains white hegemony, um, and and their larger goal is normally to do it in a way that where when you are forced them forced them to change, they will ameliorate the conditions but maintain co controlling us. So I would be okay with um I think the two politicians from Oregon and Missouri who introduced some joint resolution about removing the 13th Amendment's language around the punishment clause and um any language that d expects the captured prisoners to engage in some type of involuntary servitude. Yes, that would be a, a, a move forward, a positive move forward. And, and the reason why we say involuntary is because we also know, and we're very clear, that in the prisons, there's some type of economy that there. So if the people want to work, they should be able to work and get fair wages like or whatever. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of conversations around that, but um, I end by saying, like, if there's a way where uh, organized block voting block or organized movement can engage with public policy, engage with the electoral system to make their lives more easier so that they can organize more effectively, let's do it. Um, but some of those things are, I guess, within the discussion. So if, if I'm going to amend anything on the constitution, uh, scientifically it is, something that's going to help us um, move forward to destroy the constitution and the people that wrote it. So it's so safe to say, uh, because, uh, so is it safe to say that you think that, uh, that, that black and similar communities 
that that they shouldn't be too much involved in movements that that are all about constitutional reforms. Is it safe to say that? And 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 if so, why do you think uh you know our people and, and similar colonized people shouldn't be too involved with you know with stuff like that? As yeah, I'm I'm curious your response to that. Yeah, so I mean, I think it's important to point out that like black communities and black bodies are normally constitution free, right? The constitution don't really apply to, it, especially when you got oh. the armed agents of the state. Like that, like there's, I don't remember the phrase of like there's no, no black man has any rights that's worth upholding. I don't, I don't remember the quote, but so we live in, live in communities and in these bodies normally in constitutional free zones um and i don't know that it is worth to legitimize the constitution um the genocidal constitution as opposed to knowing that there's things that you need to struggle for again to make your material conditions better so that you could get a better grip on on the organizing that you're doing um but i also don't believe like well if the u.s had a better constitution a more inclusive constitution but does imperialism still happen? Does does the does the people get their land back? Do we get to be uh, repaired back to the the position that we were before they came and stole it? So I don't want to, you know, I'm not saying don't engage in a political process that makes your material conditions better. I'm just not sure that trying to reform the America Constitution. Or trying to make the America project better. There's no way to make the America project better. The the best way to make the America project better is destroy the American project. That that's what it'll make the planet better. Um. So yeah. So again, non-reformist reforms good. Helps you uh meet the needs so you can be a better organizer to eventually destroy the system that is anti-African and anti-life. And the social order that maintains that anti-African, anti-life position has to go. So however you want to do it, do it. Following up on that, are the spaces that you organize with uh, connecting, as you mentioned, are they connecting that if we want a world with less policing or an end to policing and the state terrorism that comes with that, we need also to abolish the CIA, the NSA, and the U and even the U.S. military, <laughs> and not just because of the crimes they commit against our communities, but also what they do overseas. Because I, because I, I remember once talking with 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 an abolitionist in uh, Canada, and I was saying to him that like, and, and, and I was and I was saying to the brother that you know that the uh, U.S. military, the Canadian military, that is the police on steroids. So I'm curious, <laughs> so I'm curious your response to that. Yeah, so the U.S. Uh, pathological, well, the pathological U.S. and its hundreds, I don't know how many, hundreds of military bases around the world proves that they are genocidal occupiers. And when you look at the police state in the U.S., it's the same shit. So when you see a cop city, you see a cop city everywhere, whether it's on uh, Coppin State in Baltimore, whether it's the, the forest hand in Atlanta, you choose it. Uh, Renee just made a, a beautiful uh, uh, map of all of the cop cities that's popping up. So, and I'm actually damn near depressed when I engage people in Atlanta and they don't understand what cop city means. So sometimes I say, okay, well, you think America is a black Wakanda. I mean, black Atlanta is a black Wakanda. <laughs> and although in this black Wakanda, the wealth disparity has been the largest in the country. So white the wealth, white the black wealth disparity in Atlanta has been the largest in the country, the, the Wakanda. And not only that, but this majority black city who keeps declining in, in, in number of black folks now just clear out of one of their lungs, the Atlanta lungs where the water and the air is clean. One of those are destroyed. And adding to that is bombs and missiles and tactical stuff. So you're making the air and the water bad and not to mention, there's a stat that says in 2053, black wealth is going to be zero. So imagine a dirty air, dirty water, no wealth, a militarized police. What the hell you think going to happen after that? And so to me, it's very frustrating that there are you know people who just go on with their day and not know what the hell going on. The bomb can go off tomorrow and they'll be shocked as shit, right? 
Um, but you you damn near if you really think about the military and the police and the CIA, all of them, you know, whatever alphabet boys they call them in the hood. Um, you damn near got yeah, yeah, the, the, the the alphabet state terrorists too. Yeah, yeah, them guys. <laughs> um, you you damn near have a domestic and an international Africom. So just as well as Africom is doing their shit in Africa, and you got Southcom. You got the same shit here in Atlanta, Com. If you want to, they trying to command and control Atlanta just as well as any other cities. You're always going to police state around here, and so in each of those locations that they're trying to police the, you know, um, the world, they're trying to combat black, red, and brown scare, right? People who are trying to be free. They, they, that's what that's what they call in the terrorists. Um, and essentially, they have the same cause, and both of them are engaged, right? The international police and the national police, the local police and the domestic, I mean, uh, international police, both of them are engaged in militarism or they're commanded by militarists, right? That's why they're trading weapons and trading tactics and learn, you know, like, <laughs> and so um, if you look at some of the, even the black political puppets, right? They the class, yeah. The black ones, yeah, absolutely. They will agree to NSA spying on people and all this other shit. But yes, just as well as we need to delegitimize the armed agents of the state, the domestic armed agents of the state, we need to also delegitimize and disrupt, dismantle, destroy the international agents of the states, the mercenaries and all this other stuff, whether they got suits on or other costumes with guns, <laughs> whatever it is, they need to go. And actually, and uh, you mentioned that, that that you're involved in a lot of uh, eco uh, justice uh, movements. So, so I have to ask this question, which is, uh, are a lot of, uh, of the eco justice groups, are they, are, are, have a lot of them connected the dots that, that that we can't de that that we can't solve the climate crisis unless we actually abolish militarism and all forms of militarism, whether it's NATO, whether it's supporting the uh, pivot to Asia, which is which is jitting up for a for a potential hot war with uh, China. And if a lot of them haven't uh, connected those dots, why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I I'm not a I'm I'm a untrained. Uh person that's into ecology for the for the simple fact of it's like I just know like for instance I was hiking with a crew the other day and one of them was like um joking about she dropped the water bottles like oh I don't want to lose water because we you know we run out of water and I was like I told the other one like you know we had the same water on the planet since the planet has been here you know it's not getting new water now when we lose our ability to clean the damn water you should be worried or we lose our ability to clean the air right so you start cutting out all these damn trees and eroding all the soil, we gonna die, right? So ecological uh, intentions in that sense, but but the few people that I'm around, rather I'm doing research with them or organizing with them, they they're very clear on connecting the two, and and so much that this idea of like individuals recycling and all this doing these little green stuff, they know that that's not how it works. Yes. All of the industries have to change the way in which they engage with people and environment, including the military, including the capitalist industries who are constantly uh, tarnishing um, the soil and the air. So I haven't seen much serious people in any ecological or environmental engagement that, that don't understand that U.S. imperialism is damn near the biggest purveyor of uh, the eco side is happening. Um, not again. There are, you know, the liberal... greatest enemies. Uh, Abby Martin, uh, I believe, is working uh, with uh, with uh, Empire Files. Is going to do a a, a, very, a very big documentary about that, and mm -hmm. it's called yeah. Earth's Greatest Enemy. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. US but I mean, military, but you... all militaries, I would say. But yeah, yeah. I, but you obviously know, like, there's the you know the liberal green, and there's you know, the again, the state has this this way of. The U.S. in particular has this way of adapting to whatever, whatever the hell you think is popular. They go, so they're gonna talk liberal green shit soon, right? So you get excited about Marcus Garvey again. They're gonna make a movie about Marcus Garvey. They did it with Malcolm X, and they might use, you know, the clown class to come out there and do it. Spike Lee, um, whoever yeah. else, Shaka King, 
whoever, whoever they want to call to remake a vi whenever we get attention to something, they have a way of reshaping and retelling it and controlling it. So yes, there are some liberal green people who who want you to you know eat eat plants, be vegan, <laughs> while paying for Israel to commit genocide on the Palestinian people. So yeah. So, 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 so that would be, so that would be one of the reasons why, uh, why a lot of green groups haven't uh, connected, haven't, well, supposedly they have not connected the dots, but, <laughs> but it's because a lot of them have been co-opted by uh, the U.S., which is, uh, which, which we, and, and, I, and we do have to compliment our enemies on this. U.S., uh, the, the, the U.S., the U.S. propaganda machine, as well as the Canadian propaganda machine, is a brilliant machine because they have managed to have done that with 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 with, with even just causes. They've even managed to like co opt that and make it into a way in which like now it's like ah now you're a norm of the state again, <laughs> right? Yeah. But yeah, my, I have a a, a friend, uh, uh, Bob Emotep in uh, Baltimore. He um he said one of his elders said this thing, and and I mean I, you can struggle with the analogy a little bit, but you know on on both sides. But he said. You know, your enemies are not dummies, right? Anybody who can make it from the caves to the moon, you should take them seriously, right? And again, there's some wiggle room around the cave and moon and all that other stuff, but said all that to say is like, you're not playing with no, you know, prima, donna, prima donnas. They they are very effective in what they're doing. Um, and I, I don't know, again, that don't make them immortal or, or all powerful. It's just that the areas of human activity, they have a really effective organized way of controlling all those things um and so I, I think it's important and yeah propaganda education being a being also in control of the domains of discourse like what the hell you argue about these people are in control of as well right and so I, yeah i think it's important to take them serious study them as well as us and some of us who got it right and um get organized my second to last question I wanted to ask you, uh, because 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 I find it because uh, because I find it interesting people who say that there is no reform in the police, and I also find it quite interesting uh, your you know your opinion that you know uh, f the constitution, we need to rip it up, and we need to have a completely different people powered constitution. So, so, so my second to last question I want to ask you is, what do you say to others, no matter what, no matter no matter what their skin color is, whether they're a white leftist, black leftist, indigenous leftist, Latinx leftist, but what do you say to some of those folks who say that, look, there's a lot of good in the Constitution. Yes, the Constitution was founded by slave, uh, uh, as George Carlin said, slave owners that wanted to be free. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, and and there's a lot of ugly stuff about the Constitution. The Supreme Court has uh, has ruled uh, against uh, you know a lot of our basic humanity with their corporate personhood and and you know you know and abolishing reproductive rights and so forth. But there's a lot of good stuff in the Constitution, and we just need to reform it. Our our people power movements need to be uh, you know need, need to definitely be organized and mobilized. To just, yeah, to just you know reform the constitution as opposed to just completely ripping it up and starting from scratch. Given you know how you know our powerful you know given how powerful our, our enemies are, whether they're right wing Democrats or the very reactionary fascistic Republicans, I'm I'm curious your response on that. Yeah, I think a couple things. I, I wouldn't call them people left, maybe left or center. But then I would ask them like, what what the fuck is good? What is good? Like, the good is normally subjective. So if you're telling me something good, tell me what particular is good and then how. And there should be some type of scientific evidence. So it'd be like, well, hey, well, there's more people millionaires than it was last year. Like, okay, well, there's more people in poverty, and there's people are life uh, again. Life expectancy span is is growing. Um, growing. Uh, three more cities don't have clean water. Like what? So what is good? So in particular, if they're able to show me what's good in the constitution, then we would have to sit with the fact that, okay, if something is good in the constitution, then Europeans create what, what is good. So they say, you know, no land should be, which the constitution didn't say that, no land should be privately owned. If, if, the, if, the, if the constitution said that, we know that the Europeans for a fact didn't create that 
that law. And so I'm okay to struggle with those things. What is good and what is ugly? Tell me what is ugly and then ask us why. And so I would, I, I, as you can see on the show, I do more questioning than answering because I feel like um, this idea of like talking, 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 sometimes those people who talk, to shut them up, you have to ask them intentional questions that they know they ask can't answer and they get stumped and then they shut up. Okay, well, this is why you don't know. Now let's, now let's actually work on the answer. So those people, if you out there, give me facts. Show me the good. Tell me why it's good and show me the ugly and tell me why you think it's ugly and then we can work from there. But if you can't do those things, I don't want to talk about nothing else. I don't even want you to, don't even show up to the whatever meeting or anything we're doing because it, Cause I, I, cause, cause I, a lot of times I think people are literally saying these things. Like for instance, uh, the other day on social media, like I know you've seen like, ah, what is those books that everybody have to read? The Alchemist and and five, whatever the hell. He, some guy was talking about, you know, oh yeah, I read those book and it really changed my paradigm. And it, did. I'm like, man, all those books is liberal and shit. You want like, and then somebody said, what books you suggest? I don't suggest books. You tell me what you want to read and what you're inter interested in, too. And then I could say, oh, you should probably check this person out. But I'm not just going to do it. Like, you know how many books I read? You know how many things? Like, that's so, um, again, this people use different tactics to be liberal and not want to struggle through things. And and the, the old gospel saying, I'm being facetious by gospel, but Sophia Bakari, Sophia Bakari says, and most other people, and I think it's, Mao or Lennon or somebody, but if there's no investigation, no right to speak, no evidence, shut the hell up. That's it. <laughs> and actually, uh, I'm going to break my rule. I, I, I actually, I'm actually going to ask you one last uh, question before we before we get to the question there, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is, when we talk, which is when you talk about liberalism. What 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 to you is liberalism, and why aren't the liberal and and why aren't and, and why aren't the liberals our friend, and why and why and, and why humanity should actually reject this idea of a liberal uh, democracy? I'm curious. I'm curious your response on that. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it. Yeah, I don't even know if that's. A, I, I don't know if if you could even liberal democracy. It sounds weird to me, but because for, because I was because I assume. It's an oxymoron because yeah, yeah, liberal yeah, democracy guarantee uh, because a liberal democracy says that you have to have the free markets, which of course yeah no I mean I I think again like you have to be in a space where anything that is said to be scientifically proven and there has to be evidence behind it, um, and then two, the idea of not wanting to struggle. And also, again, when I talk about controlling the domains of discourse, you know, Kwame Ture uh, said this in a speech one time. He was saying how people, they don't they don't know anything about socialism. They don't read it or anything. And then some, someone says like, well, you know, I know socialism is bad, right? Because my professor told me it was bad. And that, that was it. And, I, and then also another time I remember asking a brother, he was like, uh, you know, I, you know I'm, all, I'm for capitalism. You know, I don't want socialism and I don't want, you know, somebody getting paid for money I work for. I mean, things I work for. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what are you talking about? Like, what do, what do you think happens in capitalism? So, like, again, majority of the people are normally engaged in rhetoric to dismiss dialogue and dismiss dealing with uh, and struggling, having ideological struggles. And the ameliorative solutions are more so to loosen up to get a tighter grip. So again, like when you reform, so so I watched this uh what's the thing? Um ah uh, Andor, the, the recent one, and how I don't normally watch stuff like that. Jared and Ricky got me to watch it. But um the prison that they was in was one of the best. I mean, uh, shit, you would want to live there. Like you could you got the you could eat any type of food and it's all clean or whatever. And the only thing was the, the floors are shot. Right. The floors will shock you if you do the wrong thing. But, you know, they like so creating a prison like that, which they are doing, actually, with Cop City and the um, Fulton County Jail. One of the proposals is a, a company who actually built the first humane prison in um, Israel. Right. Or Palestine, shall I say. Yeah. 
And so to me, it would be hella liberal to um, build an in, inhumane, I mean, a humane prison as opposed to challenge the actual idea of criminality. Mm -hmm. And you will criminalize people who are engaged in, who are forced to engage in the survival economy more than, than you criminalize people who are literally stealing labor and lives and money laundering and all this other stuff. So yeah, like I, I wouldn't want to have those uncritical, unprincipled uh, reforms and ameliorative suggestions. Um, I, I would want to struggle for a, a radical, ref radical change, which means getting to the root of the problem. And I don't think liberals allow you to get to the root. They're very yeah. creative to dance around. Definitely. Well, we uh, we normally end the show with the questionnaire done by Marcel Proust and later popular French broadcaster Bernard Pivot and later my hero, of course, the late great James Lipton inside the actor studio. Geechee, it's your turn to do this before uh, uh, and, and then you can enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Uh, what's your favorite word? I was struggling with this. I don't know, maybe uh, Aruhu, the K Swahili word for uh, freedom. Freedom and liberation. So, Aruhu. What's your least favorite word then? Mm, maybe like ecocide and genocide. <laughs> what right inspires you emotionally, spiritually, or psychologically? Or what turns you on emotionally, spiritually, or psychologically? Uh, life itself, self determination, being in control of your life, sustaining resources. And then what? And then what? And then what turns you off then? Not having those previous senses. <laughs> <laughs> What sound or noise do you love? Um, I mean, I, I actually thought about like hearing the ocean and waterfalls and then maybe the saxophone, but yeah, definitely hearing. You know, it's funny. Many people on this program have said that they love the sound of the ocean and, and you know, and yeah. good rains and so forth and music. Therapeutic. So, so fantastic. <laughs> then, then, then what sound or noise do you, uh, do you absolutely dislike then? Holy sirens. What's your favorite curse words? Black power. <laughs> you know, all right i'm just gonna go to the next question that's a good a good response <laughs> what profession if you weren't doing yours would you uh would you love to attempt um be a better organizer journalist and researcher <laughs> okay and then what profession Same one but better and then and then what profession would you absolutely not want to do under any circumstances yeah, I can't even think of one. So the ones that I don't think about. All right. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and and final one. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say as you arrive at the pearly gates or whatever is your vision of the afterlife? And even if you're an atheist, please answer the question. Um, I don't think I want to hear anything God had to say because I would want his actions or its actions or her or whatever the fuck actions to have shown me that the question that you're asking right now is irrelevant because all the massive suffering, the massive and constant suffering, what would the fuck, what was that for? Um, also, I wouldn't want to go to a pearly gates. I wouldn't want to go behind the pearly gates with those other parasites because I'm fully clear that the pearls came from African and other indigenous children and people being exploited in early. So who the fuck want to go through some pearly gates? And then in terms of the afterlife, I would rather, let's just talk about it when we get there. <laughs> let's talk about when we get there. It's right now, why we in this life focus on organizing against the people who are trying to extract these lives from us. And as, uh, what's the guy name? I keep uh, blanking on his name, but the people who are trying to uh, force us to lose our bodies, Ta-Nehisi Coates. I like the way he phrased that. Black people losing their bodies. So, yeah. Well, we were <laughs> well, we were joined on. <laughs> oh, I'm looking forward to seeing the responses to that one. <laughs> well, we yeah, were yeah, joined yeah. on this edition of One Plus One with Kichi Yang, who, as as as, as you, you you've heard him here, he is an organizer. He's a he's a black leftist. He's an anti imperialist. He's an eco socialist activist and indie journalist and co host co panelist of Earn Your Liberation at Black Power Media which is news commentary and analysis from a black left perspective and folks need to subscribe and donate generously to that organization. Geechee, thank you so much for coming, uh, for coming on. We have to, 
have to have you on as as a regular because there's so much that you opened the lid on that I, that, that, that I want to dissect. But for now, keep doing the great work you do, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you, brother Yuri. Appreciate you.